How's everybody doing today? We having a good conference? Learn lots of good stuff? So how many people here have used any sort of event sourcing before? Cool. How many of you had a good time with it? <laughs> okay. So everybody else had a little bit of trouble. <laughs> um, I wish that was a lot less common. Um, but hopefully by the end of today, or this next hour, you're going to have a very good understanding of how to be successful with event sourcing, and in particular, how to use it in your cloud applications. So that's our goal. Simple, scalable cloud applications, right? Because event sourcing is the most natural model to integrate with your distributed systems. Most distributed systems need to use log replication, messaging for communication, and those are completely in line with event sourcing as storing all of your changes in an immutable log of changes, right? <clears throat> but let's talk about the core problem that we have to deal with in software and in distributed systems. What's the enemy, right? I have one microservice, I'm all good. I have two microservices, I, I can kind of understand that. Three microservices, four microservices, five microservices. That's 124 interconnections that I have to understand if everything can talk to everything else with a message. <clears throat> or if everything can understand my messages and might have decided to use my messages and my event sourcing. So even if I don't know if you're using my internals, you might be anyway, if you're in a large organization. This problem of combinatorial complexity is how we get this. This is an actual live system that I worked on many years ago. This is a dependency SQL diagram of a single SQL Server database. And if we take a look here, that's the policy table. These are the store procedures. Those are the inbound dependencies, and gray is the outbound dependencies. My laptop wasn't, almost didn't have enough juice to generate this diagram using Redgate. I definitely had to use the simple bubble render to get this image up. But we can also clearly see here, that probably ought to be an application, right? A separate set of services that all work together. That right there probably ought to be a separate domain. I'm betting this should be a shared context, right? We see it in the cloud too. This is the web of interconnected microservices from a recent successful deployment. As you can see, it's improvement over this. <laughs> but we can still get into the same trouble, right? So how do we avoid that? Well, what do you think we did here? What pattern? Anybody? So we went from everybody talking to everybody to what? Simple layered architecture. UI, business logic, data layer. It helps a little bit. So I went, as I went um, building different systems and insurance, other places, I learned these strategies. They're still very valuable. But then I took this course. Well, not this particular course, but with this guy. And I learned about CQRS and DDD. And what CQRS says is that rather than doing two-way connections between everything, we can separate out our reads and our writes, right? Which doesn't seem like a huge thing until you realize what you get is this. Every single component on this 
is now a one-way processor. I can isolate this and test this and know. You know, if you were in uh, Kevlin's talk, QPR, given when then, a single input output. If you ever done any database integration, any low level back and forth, it is far, far simpler to do a one way integration than a two way. You know, you can think of this as, this is my third normal form data structure in my database. This is my first normal form reporting database, right? So it's the same thing. We want to have everything going in one direction to keep ourselves same, right? But as I went to this course and I learned about DDD and CQRS and event sourcing, I got back and I tried to train my team. And it went okay, but it didn't go what I would call well. And what really bothered me was that the first item on both lists, it was clearly not that the people I was talking to weren't smart. They were good developers. They just didn't get it. There was something I was unable to share with them about how this worked. I also found it interesting that people with messaging, functional programmers, that was trying to kind of go together. But DDD is a little bit different. But they got it at a better rate as well. Whereas people who were used to ORMs, relationally object order, had a little bit more trouble with this. So what I wanted was a fourth book here. I needed some way to take the patterns of how you build things and say, how do we have a good pattern for building event source systems that I can talk about, communicate clearly about, and just have people get it and not have to sit down and talk with them, you know, on every code review. The problem is, as I started researching this, is we have been lacking good definitions for what exactly event sourcing is, right? CQRS, event sourcing, not a top level architecture. That's just saying you're not gonna deal with it, right? Application state is a left full to previous behaviors. Functional people love this. But it actually only talks about how your application works. Event sorting, sourcing is a storage decision. It's right up there with, do I wanna use a graph database? Do I wanna use a relational database? Or a document database, right? Application state is persistent and append only log. Getting a little bit better, but it doesn't really, dis you know, what if I store all my inputs? What if I store my application state, right? That's not really event sourcing. And the last one here is from Martin Fowler's Blicky, right? All changes application state sequels event. It's about the same as the previous one. And if you read the original article, he actually talks about three or four different patterns, right? And actual event sourcing is only one of them. And he doesn't make any clear distinctions there. To be fair, he also has draft written in the very top of it, and he'll get back to it sometime, right? So if we think about our problem, we're really missing a top level decision about storage. Relational storage, graph storage, document, ordered storage. So all of these things are types of ordered storage. It's a persistent mechanism where you append data in the order it's received in an immutable log, right? And it gives rise to allowing us to talk about the different patterns. Who here has ever used a log? in your application? Yes, no, maybe, right? How about a ledger? You know, anybody done anything with Bitcoin? Right? So if you write down all your transactions in order, you have a ledger, an event stream. Now event stream is just data, right? 
we're not really talking about application yet. This could be a series of sensor readings, temperatures, stock ticks. These are external things coming in. These next four are really application storage patterns, right? And this is where I kept on running into trouble with people, trying to get them to understand the difference between these four patterns and why it made a difference. Unstructured data, transactions, ordered states, or facts. So in order to talk about these, I want to talk about how do we actually create an event writer. And the best model I've been able to find is this. Anybody know what that is? It's a Turing machine. Alan Turing, you have a tape. It writes things to tape, it reads from the tape, reads back and forth. The first general computer. So if we take this Turing machine and we make a specialized version of it in software, where we say the tape is only going to move forward, we're only going to write to the next position, and we're going to actually react to external inputs. Right? So now we have a state machine, very simple state machine, that applies the history of events. After it's done that, it's going to accept a command, modify its internal state, and emit a decision or an event to be written to the next position in the log. Now, if we go back here, we can now start defining these. If I'm saving the inputs to the state machine, I'm command sourcing. If you have a disconnected system, this can be a really, really good pattern. So I have my offline system, I save all the commands. When I reconnect, I replay the commands. And then I deal with anything that happens. If I'm saving the internal state, then I'm state logging. If I'm saving a delta on the internal state, then I'm doing change logging. Change data capture, SQL Server, that's what it does. If we take mementos and back them up, your backup system is saving internal state. If we're saving the output of the state machine, the decision that it made, then we're event sourcing. And there's a very important detail with this. If I'm going to understand the commands or the events, and I want to recreate my state, if I'm dealing with the internal state of this machine or the command that came into this machine, what do I need if I want to recreate that? If I have a machine that went down, I need to rebuild my position. I need the exact same version of this machine, right? And that could be version one, shipping version two, shipping version three. If we say that the event that we produce is going to be a modeled business event, a historical fact or decision the business has made, now, this state machine is, isn't coupled to the event. So I now have a history of business facts that occurred that are not tied to the details of implementation of any one service. So the simplest thing is version one or version two of that service, right? If I have a log that's defined separately from that internal state, I can easily run A-B tests. I can have different versions of this. I could actually have several different machines all running and interpreting the same log. So as soon as I want in the cloud, I want to have lots of microservices. Having this log disconnected from that internal state is how we avoid all that coupling we saw before. Command sourcing is inputs. Change logging is internal state. State logging is the whole, or delta, whole state. 
historical business events or facts. Any questions on that? Right? It seems like a subtle point, but it's really the crux of where I've seen most people get bound up with event sourcing. They start saving the changes in their internal states. They get to time where it's versions and they've got to update the software and they find this immutable record they can't do anything with because they've tied together their states with the log. Now, the other thing you'll notice here is what's the classic definition of a microservice? Accepts inputs, handles invariants, has its own internal storage. This writer, with the constraint that each writer has one stream, is the smallest microservice you can build. Now, if you want to put a bunch together, call an application, you absolutely can. The other thing, well, we'll get to that in a second. So, to repeat, the domain model or the data model is what you version the event with. Your services need to be able to be versioned separately. You want to be able to release code at a faster rate or a different rate than when you want to change your data schema. Application decisions persisted as an immutable sequence of business events. So, when we actually want to build an application, we need more than just a writer. We also need an event processor or a reader that's going to create our derived states. Now, what, we're going to, what we have here is really three core components. We have event writer, event storage, and an event processor. And we have any number of these. I can have, you know, four different types and 50 instances of the writers, various readers. Each writer is going to be reading and writing from one stream. And we want these streams to be fine-grained. If we think about this in terms of a relational data model, right? These writers, this would be account one, account two, account three. These are going to be equivalent to rows with identity in the database. They're not equivalent to tables, right? Because I have to hydrate from this stream to be able to evaluate the next step. Now, there's a lot of easy things I can do about, because I have an ordered sequence and I know the exact number of all the events, I can write a checkpoint and use a snapshot and rehydrate myself. There's no reason I can't persist my private state in a cache. I just don't want to have that be my primary storage. I also want to be able to have these, this storage use optimistic concurrency. That means if I have, suppose we're dealing with account here, and I have 50 instances of account processors, and they're all accepting commands from that. If two commands come into two different microservices that are processing on the same account, I don't want both of those commands to write to the log. Suppose one of them is lock my account, and another one is, we'll drop $5,000 from an ATM, right? Because I've had a fraud alert. I don't, it's not acceptable inside my application to lock the account and then withdraw the money, right? In one order, they're okay. In the other order, they're not. So I want optimistic concurrency on this. All right, sorry. Optimus concurrency, I want fine-grained streams, I want ordered numbering on the streams. One of the largest deep problems we have to deal with in distributed systems is message delivery, out-of-order messages, missed messages, duplicate messages. 
if I have a simple sequence number and I see one, two, four, I know I missed three, right? If I see five and then I see three, I know I can ignore it. I can't solve the problem of whether or not I get five, the newest one, with this, but I can solve that with some sort of SLA or watcher that's watching the two systems to make sure messages don't get missing. But most of my message ordering problems can be simply solved with a simple sequence number on the stream. Global ordering. So let's go back here and talk about this event processor. The writers are constrained to a single stream, but all those streams are part of a logical log. So inside the boundaries of my application, I want a global ordering on all of the fine-grained streams. What if I think, what if these are all accounts in my bank, right? And I want to have total deposits as a report. So I'm going to take all the different deposits I'm going to draw on all the different accounts. And if I don't always replay those in the same order, and I regenerate my total amount on deposit, I'm going to get a different answer. So inside the scope of this application, I need global ordering across all those streams. Now, as we scale up in the cloud, that's not going to scale. So we have to decide the boundaries of our application or our microservice based upon those reporting needs. What are we writing out here? Because we always need to be able to read or arrive state in external systems. Right. So we've got primary state and derived state. Now this derived state could be a view for your application. It could be a web page you generate. It could be a relational database. It could be a graph database. It could be a document database. It could be a whole chain of polyglot data systems. All we're saying when we say we're event sourcing is that the primary storage is events. We could then issue messages, caches, web pages, databases, whatever's most appropriate for the system. I'm working on a system right now where we take event streams in, we process them into graph databases, we use the graph database to evaluate interconnections, and then we produce tables that we bind our web UI to. Because the end user just sees a list of tasks. Why am I going to build that from a stream database or from a graph database? I'm just going to go and pull tables. So I'm going to use a simple web UI. I'm going to bind to tables. This user is going to see their tasks in a table. Their commands still come back through the system. We want to have a database guarantee on that. When we write something, we want to know that it's written and committed. We want to be able to do positional queries. If I have a reader or a writer that needs to go back to a point in time, because eventually we always have to assume that everything is going to break or need to be rebuilt. Services are going to go down. Outages are going to happen. Data is going to get corrupted. We want to go back and say, can I get event number five? Can I get event number... 356. We also want to, we don't need it, but we want push notification. We want to be able to say, I simply have my processors subscribed to an event stream that's going to push committed events out to it. Just going to make my life a lot simpler, along with catch up subscriptions. Questions? Yes, no, maybe. All right. So, so event processors are also an event-driven state machine. One of the key differences is that we're putting a constraint on the event writers 
say the event writer is only looking at one stream, and the sensibility of the events that we're writing here follow third normal form conventions. You want to be sparse in the writers. The writers should not hold any private state that's not used for an invariant. If you don't need the data for a business rule that you need to evaluate on whether or not you're going to write an event, don't put it in here. This is not like an active record or an ORM object where I pull all my state up to look at it. The only thing I'm going to keep is those items that I need internally to evaluate a command. Right? If I have a user object in well, let's go back to account, it's easy. If I don't have overdraft limit on my account object, I'm just accepting credits and debits, I don't need to keep a running balance in here. If I do have a business reason, absolutely, keep your running balance. But slim everything down. The only thing that goes in here are the pieces of data you need to evaluate your business rules. The events that you emit here, should be the same way you do a third normal form. Don't repeat data on two different events. Those events need to be, any piece of data shouldn't be duplicated. I've seen people on a regular basis go, well, I need the full name of this person when the credit's approved, so the credit approval event will have their name on it, right? The problem is that the stream that's as a credit approval, isn't where you're managing their name. You want to put an ID to the location, the same way you would do a join across two tables in third normal form. It also helps you decide what is an aggregate or a stream or a microservice, because if this microservice can only read from this stream, and it has to have all the information to evaluate the business rules, then that tells you what your boundaries are for how big your microservices can be, right? So that helps you determine those boundaries. And then it's out of scope for this talk, but if you do have to cross microservices, you can set up a saga and do a write ahead commit to multiple different services to deal with transactions. It's very similar to the inbox, inbox outbox box pattern that you were talking about the other day. So on the processor side, we want to invert that thinking, right? The processors or the readers are first normal form. Every output they're going to create should be targeted to a purpose. It should be for a screen, for a database, for some sort of target. Feel free to duplicate data and pull all of those individual events together from wherever you need them to create that targeted state. Um, The other thing that you want your event producers to do is make sure they track their position. One of the things you gen generally need to do when you track your position is whatever you're writing as your target, if I have an event, you know, a producer or processor, I'm sorry, that's writing out to a database, I should write the position in the master log with the transaction into my relational database when I write the commit. That's how I'm going to know where I got to in following this log. So when I go back, this processor, so here we have our master event log, event one, two, three, four, five. In the individual streams, we can see that this stream is event one, but event two goes this stream, event three goes here, four goes here, right? The event processors are going to follow the master log for this application boundary. That gets persisted 
into the target in a transactional commit so you know where you're at when you rebuild. This ID is what the writer uses to track the position of that individual processor. Those form vector clocks that you can use to identify where you're at. Who here understands what a vector clock is or did I just use some weird mumbo jumbo? All right, so all a vector clock is, is saying rather than using timestamps, I'm gonna use a series of positions to know where I am in a log. That can either be the master log number or it can be a combination of say like the position five and position two if I'm looking at a subset of the streams. We also need to be able to rebuild any system on demand whenever it's lost, gets corrupted, or just upon request, right? So that talks about our applications, right? And event sourcing belongs inside an application boundary, okay? So we have a writer, persistence, processor. So we always accept input, committed event, committed events only go to the processor. We never want to make a decision and publish that event out on a bus before it's been committed internally. We're gonna wind up with race conditions, failure conditions. We always wanna process it, commit it, publish it. Process, commit, publish. But when we look at a larger system, as we said before, that internal storage isn't going to scale, and it shouldn't. Event sourcing is something you should do inside of an application boundary. That processor should then use an anti-corruption layer to produce a public event. Has anyone here read Pat Helen's paper, Data on the Inside, Data on the Outside? All right, here's a different question. If you're writing application, would you allow any other application in your company to access your private schema and not have to tell you about it? Yes? No? No? Right. That's data on the inside, data on the outside. That says that the events in here, in your application, should be fine-grained, they're normal form events, but the data that everyone else consumes should be public data. You should have a separate schema and you should public, publish public events here. This follows the practices of good API design, right? In here, I'm doing local calls. I want nice, fine grained interfaces. But when I'm publishing publicly, I don't want consumers to have to call back to me for more information. I want all the information they need to process this to be there in the event. And again, back to first normal form, I may publish the entire state of an object here and then republish it with every update because I don't want consumers coming back to me. So I want to publish here this event processor when it receives an event, should be able to deal with it by itself without asking me more information. If it does need to or something does need to catch up, we should provide catch up interfaces the same way we talked about here about going back and restarting from a known position. We should provide public interfaces to allow external systems to say, hey, we're missing event number X or event number Y in your public stream. When we're looking at these distributed event buses, we're talking about Kafka, Kinesis, um, Azure event bus, right? These are gonna be partially ordered streams, right? They're focused on ingress, they're focused on accepting new events in, and they're gonna order things like, for example, Kafka by partition. 
But this ordering and this grouping is going to be closer to ordering by a table. All of the accounts are going to be in an ordered segment, right? It's going to be a fairly large ordered system. It's not going to be fine-grained. We're also going to have external event sources. We're going to have events coming in, stock ticks, temperature changers, sensor readings. These aren't part of our applications, but they're events. So this event bus is going to have facts, public events, business events, everything is on it for these downstream systems to consume. And this has a schema of its own that they deal with. And so this public schema becomes your contract that you need to support as you change. You want to be able to take your microservice or your application, pick it up, make an internal change, not bring anyone downstream. So you're going to be publishing, you might be publishing legacy public events. You might add in new ones. Wait for all your consumers who are using legacy to eventually go through little life cycles and be retired and remove them. But this duality of schema is how we separate out our state and we don't tie ourselves in so we can all keep on moving forward. Right? Of course, we're gonna... the other thing which I see as a fairly common mistake that people are making is they see this bus here has their event store, right? Everything on this bus has a couple of problems. One, most distributed logs don't have any optimistic currency. If we go back to our example of lock my checking account, we'll draw $5,000. They're designed for ingress. They're de designed for distributed operations. They're gonna accept all of the incoming events. They're not looking to lock things, and they shouldn't. But as you build your applications, that, if this is your only store, that becomes very problematic. They're also generally, if you read the fine print, not guaranteeing the rights. Now those rights will be there, 99, 99.9, 99.9% of the time, but it's not a database level commit guarantee, right? And if you, if you do turn on those database level commit guarantees, which you can, you'll find that the throughput that you wanted them for goes away, right? Because you can't have a locking guarantee right to disk and have high ingress and throughput. So they're going to tell you that's not an appropriate use case for your system. They're not, there's nothing wrong with this. They're operating correctly at scale, doing exactly what you want. Just don't mistake them for your database. You want to keep your databases locked away. Your primary storage is completely valid to publish not just your public event bus, but to a public reporting database, right? Take your same event processor, right to a reporting database, right to a document store, right to a data warehouse, a data lake. This is all about your primary storage and history of facts and events. Everything after this point is derived data and should be able to be recreated. The other thing you can do, I didn't show it on here, but all of these systems, in addition to the event bus, you're most likely going to have a messaging bus for commands and events going through your system. You can take and wrap your legacy systems, your regular SQL Server database, has an event source that pushes events onto the bus and supports catch-ups, and then those events have sequences. So you can take non-event source systems wrap them and make them appear to your ecosystem as event sources. It allows you to decouple things, 
take your time, decide what's worth it or not worth it to convert over. Generally, all of your new stuff, this model here of having a sort of a fractal pattern where I have messages come in, they get committed to an event log, they get transformed and published, committed to an event log, consumed and processed. Everyone on your team, every component you have has the same pattern, right? I consume something, I make a decision, I commit it, I publish. That is far easier to work with. It's going to use the same tooling, same semantics, same approaches across the board. Right? Right? So that, I went through a little bit faster than I expected. So we have about five minutes left. Questions? So if this fails, all of the public events that I'm producing on here should have a sequence number for me to be able to reproduce them. So if this fails and you restore it, you should be able to catch up from your event sources and restore your state going forward. So you look at where did I get to, what's missing? So this is now at, you know, so what you do, you send a message to this saying, Please republish everything after position X, right? So the position that's going to those public events maps to your internal event log position, the master log position. Here's where I'm at. So if there's a failure, you rebuild and redistribute. And when that happens, you're going to have the case where some of these processors may have seen some of the events on the bus. Right? So we're going to be reproducing everything from where we know we were forward. So these event processors use that sequence number for item potency to know whether or not they should reprocess that event. Right? Because everything is in a little bit of an unknown state. So that master sequence here from each source is the key to have the item potency and recovering from those failures. Did that answer all your question? No, I'm going on the wrong way. Was there another question over here? Yes. There should not. Yes. So you should have a lot of, you know, think of it, your first home over form, third home form tables. You have lots of little tiny tables internally for your data. You probably have a couple of large public reporting tables. For example, um, we did a trading system where we had one internal service, which was blocking orders together. Another one that was placing those orders with a broker. So we raised, block increased, or, um, placement requested, placement received, placement committed. The public event that went out was simply order placed. All the details of the five or six different services in here that's orchestrating everything from blocks coming in, talking with third party vendors, confirming everything, none of that left the system, right? So the only things that went to the public bus were um, block created, block placed, execution complete, right? M much different granularity. Questions? Is this all that you So the processor, so inside here, you're gonna have two types of internal processors. You have internal processors that are producing data for yourself and separate ones that are producing data for the public. So it is the responsibility of the application to understand its private schema 
and produce the public schema. So this is your contract with your organization, right? And generally, you don't want to do a general public event. You want to have a request or some contract for what do we need to publish. And that's how you decide what your public interface is going to be. The same way you would have a public API on something or a public, right? So rather than having an API definition, you have a public event definition, right? Because the events are the equivalent of your database schema, they're equivalent of your API, right? So the, the columns of my table, the fields on my API, the fields in my event all have a similarity in design. Yes, so this internal processor knows the details of internal processing and it knows the details of the public event. So the pattern that's generally referred to as an anti-corruption layer. So you have one piece of code that knows about the public schema and the private schema. And that's how you keep the public schema from leaking and corrupting your private schema and vice versa. Right. So, um, the way I generally do it is I use um, a technique called event modeling, where I set up a timeline and I do wireframes of the UI or the consumers. I then say, for that UI, what read models do I need? For those read models, what data do I need? What events are going to produce that data? And so I just graph out on a timeline. And so I start at some position and I work backwards and forwards to say, if the screen is showing these things, offers these commands, what commands do I need? What events will they produce? What views or read models do I need from them? And it's similar to event storming, but the difference with event modeling is it's equivalent to a sketch versus a blueprint. It's a measure drawing. I'm not allowed to have a piece of data on a screen in a read model that's not in an event. It can't get into an event if it doesn't come in from a command. So that simple act of proving the provenance of every piece of data very quickly elaborates out a very concrete model of the entire system and produces very reliable results in terms of understanding complexity. And if you do it on something like a electronic whiteboard, I found it's very intelligible to the business. So you work to make sure that your events, because remember what I said before is, the events are business events. So I want the events in my internal model to be modeled from the business. So the business should be able to read and understand all of my internal events. So you can very easily have conversations well. If we add this here, if I have a bookstore, and we now want to add an over 18 section to my online bookstore, but we haven't ever collected age data from many of our customers, all of a sudden it really brings up, do we collect it when they log in? Do we go and request it from them? Because it's very clear the data isn't available. So I found it to be an excellent technique for developing these systems. Right, well, you need to change the public API. Then at that point, who's ever producing the public API, public data, has to now produce the old and the new, if you're gonna do a side-by-side, -side, or these systems down here need to deal with the public old and new. So some of the ways to deal with that is, if you have your event processors downstream are tied to a particular version of the schema, then you can produce a new version and they ignore the old one, right? Or you could do a coordinated release where you're saying, we are upgrading it, you're doing it. But you have the option of, do we just say some of our old events are in a different schema? You know, that's why this data here needs to be considered transient in your system. 
because there's this tyranny of the long tail, right? If I have every event I've ever produced in one log, that anything can go back to three years ago and read it. Every single version of every piece of data I've ever written, it has to understand, right? So the other thing that's very important here is as you start dealing with these systems, you want to start thinking about rolling the books. You want to say, do I follow the business year? And every year I close the books on this event store and I roll in a new one? Because very often the business, when you talk to them about this, has rules. They want to keep seven years of data. But after seven years, it should all be gone, right? Or I want to keep GDPR's data separate, right? If we're dealing with GDPR, we need to, in any data system we have, relational, document, graph, ordered, we have to separate it out. So once we've separated that data out, then we just keep the IDs in the streams. So here, this stream here might have personal information. These streams will have an ID for that. Because when I delete you as a user, I'm not going to delete the fact that 100 users visited my page on this day. I'm not going to delete all the logs and different things that happen. I'm going to delete my knowledge of who that person was. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? All right. Other questions? All right. Thank you all.